sequel oh, came to be. Shit. John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, the producers of the first film, originally wanted to make the Halloween series an anthology in the low key. What I think they, I, what I think they was trying to go for Halloween, like originally, I think they was trying to do it like uh, different like stories, or like murderers and shit, like like Michael Myers, this nigga, you know, like other other shit, not just one killer. I think they were trying to do. Different Same vein as the Twilight movie, Zone, but then with each movie telling really like all-new spectacular tales set around the holiday. Then, any movie that did well could get a spin-off series. It sounds kind of Conjuring-esque in retrospect, but there was a bit of a problem. Michael Myers had made such an impact in the original film that the other producers wanted him back, so Carpenter and Hill agreed to make one more movie <clears> about him before proceeding with their sort of jukebox of horror plan. And that's why Michael originally died at the end of Halloween 2. That was supposed to be it for him, and then on to something else. But people loved Michael Myers just too much, and you can't really blame them. Maybe if they had started this anthological approach with the first sequel, the audience would have been more understanding. But after two Halloweens starring a stalkery shape, it's not surprising that audiences expected him back for the third. And thus, Season of the Witch was a pretty big bomb that ended any plans to make a Twilight Zone of cinematic terrors. As for the movie itself, it's completely ridiculous, even if it was entirely separate from the Halloween room. series. I actually love it because of how crazy it is. In fact, the only thing I don't care for is the May December. December of the following year romance going on in it. Other than that, I love it. The witchcraft, the sci-fi, all the brutal kills. Let's see how many I'm talking about and count Did he just up. put his fingers in his fucking eye? The Hell movie begins nah. in Northern California in October. But not like on Halloween. No, this movie's given us eight days of runway till we get to the namesake holiday. A dude named Harry Grimbridge is on the run from a car coming after him. And while he's hiding out from it in a parking lot, he runs straight into a well-dressed thug who starts strangling him against the ground. In an act of desperation, Harry pulls the block a out from thug. a car's tire. And the vehicle rolls forward at a non nah, but them, them UK speed, niggas but got still it manages that last to year, crush so and kill gonna, this I'm thug for our first death of the movie. No blood or anything, but it does have a nice nasty crunch to it. Don't worry, we'll get there. Harry takes off through the junkyard, and another car I was so fucking tells lame. us it's one hour later, when a gas station attendant is watching a news report about a piece of frickin' Stonehenge that got stolen. Talk about the heist of the millennia. The commercial break includes our first instance of this insanely obnoxious silver shamrock jingle. It's morning to Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. It's morning to Halloween, silver shamrock. It's advertising three crappy masks that are apparently all the rage, even though they look like happy meal toys. Also, they're called the Halloween 3. Nice tongue-in-cheek name there. The attendant gets accosted by Harry, who passes uh, out clutching a pumpkin mask and whispering that's their fat. Time to meet our hero of fire, the story, fire, alcoholic fire. Dr. Dan Chalice, played by Tom Atkins. His ex-wife Linda is played by Nancy Kyes, who was Annie that's in the original, clean. and who's already bought their shitty kids those shitty Halloween masks. Eight more days to Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. And in Get case you're the not a fan of that kids box cover, don't worry, you can hear the original any goddamn time you turn on a Get TV your dumb ass straight to bed. <laughs> Turn that down. Although he's drunk as a skunk, Dan is called in get to take care of Harry, who is get, brought get into the, the fuck hospital up, by that friendly stairs, gas station bro, attendant, who's ass. just like, he's really gotta get out of there right now. I don't know why. Harry wakes up at the sound of the ubiquitous Silver Shamrock commercial, and he once again delivers creepy prophetic warnings. They're going to kill us. All of us. That night, after drunk horny Dan gropes yeah, one of the Yeah, I would have been like, buddy, um, they're gonna kill you, but not me. Another well-dressed thug sneaks his way into Harry's out of here. hospital room and kills the old rambling man in a seriously gnarly way, sticking his fingers right into Harry's eyes and just breaking his skull with a single hand. It's a simple kill for sure, but the way it's done is absolutely brutal, as are a lot of the kills to come. It's good stuff. Dan awakens to a nurse's Ugh. screams and stumbles his way down the hallway out to the parking lot. There he watches as the assassin sits calmly in his car, douses himself with gasoline, and lights himself on fire, giving us another explosive kill and driving home that this movie is not really a slasher. It's more of a what-the-fuck mystery that'll have to be figured out by the drunkest doctor in the Golden State. A title card tells us it's the next day when Harry's St. Vincent-looking daughter Ellie arrives at the hospital to identify his body. And then, uh, another title card tells us it's the next next day. What the fuck? And we find drunky Dan flirting with assistant coroner Teddy, trying to get some info about the Nah, them niggas just really wanted to Get wow, to the this kills, hospital bro. has one horny fucking staff. And wait, what the fuck? Dude. Now it's Friday? Why not just set your movie close to Halloween and skip all these title cards? Speaking of Halloween, at Dan's regular watering hole, Muldoon's, we get confirmation that this movie takes place in a new continuity when the TV airs a commercial advertising the immortal classic Halloween, followed by this, of course. Two more days to 
Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on. Ellie walks into this deserted bar and tells Dan that his entire staff knows he's a problematic day drinker. One of the nurses told me I could find you here. She enlists Dan to help her find out more about her father's death. She's bad. I... like a sober police officer. So she takes him to her dad's toy shop where his record shows that the last thing he did before getting that septic surgery shit. was pick up a supply of silver shamrock masks. They got alcoholics with a murderers around. Dan calls up his ex-wife like, and cancels plans with it. his kids so he can take a six-pack of roadies and head up the coast with Ellie. Real dad of the year material. Oh, and in case you were wondering what day it was. <laughs> Could we get the FCC in here to find Silver Shamrock for violating the Eighth Amendment? They drive to Santa Mira, a sleepy Irish enclave of California, played by the town of Lolita, California, population 800. It's home to the Silver Shamrock Company and a whole bunch of very nosy locals, as well as some state-of-the-art CCTV cameras. Dan and Ellie pose as a married couple as they rent a motel room, even though it'd make more sense for them to be father and daughter, given the 24-year age gap between the two actors. Tom Atkins was 47 here, and Stacey Nelkin was 23. He's literally more Shit. than twice her age. Kind of weird. Also staying at this motel Shit. is you gotta do what you gotta do, buddy. Shamrock salesperson Buddy Cuffer, yeah, like, hey, his wife Betty 20, Cuffer, and their shit heel son Buddy Jr. As well as another yeah. Silver Shamrock. If I was 60, I would have been Marty like, Gutman. make me Is Silver her Shamrock boyfriend. run like fucking Cutco knives or something? Ellie wants to head to the factory right away, but Dan is more interested it's, in it's, drinking it's, and stalling. It's getting late. As fuck. I could use a drink. Mm -hmm. Let's take our time. Then the romance kicks off, and since her dad's death has probably left her with some father issues, Ellie's totally down for some mature mustache rides. An uncredited Jamie Lee Curtis voice comes over a loudspeaker to announce Santa Mira's curfew is now in effect. But fuck if that's gonna stop Dan from getting his booze. He's got those DTs to ward off, you know? On his way back, he runs into a homeless guy named Starker, who puts forth a great argument for getting himself a swig. I, I ain't got no diseases, you mind if I have a drink? The vagrant tells Dan about the head of Silver Shamrock, Conal Cochran, who built this town up from the ground but without using any local labor. Maybe this place needs E-Verify. Starker cusses out Cochran to the night and those CCTV cameras everywhere, so after he leaves Dan, he gets attacked by two more well-dressed thugs who by now we figured out work for Mr. Cochran and Silver Shamrock. They get him to his knees, kind of suggestively, before the one played by Dick Warlock, who was part two's Michael Myers, freaking rips off Starker's head! Holy- Yo, this nigga's Dick Warlock literally- Oh, my feet are in the camera. Ew. This nigga is literally called Dick War Warlock and he's fucking a nigga face. Pause. Shit, yes! That's what I'm talking about, Halloween 3. Keep giving pause, me shit like this pause. and I will love you forever. Oh no, you're gonna give me more of this nasty romance? Ugh, okay, if you wanna be like that. The daddy-daughter couple gets to love making on the Damn. nasty motel bed where there's a way too long shot of Tom Atkins going in for some breast milk. Damn, there be daddy and mommy issues all up in this bitch. Their post-coital cuddle isn't much better to watch thanks to the smash hit they got playing on the radio. <laughs> I know, dude, I know. I guess it puts Ellie in the mood, though, because she's coming back for seconds. Aren't you just the least bit tired? Nah, dude, because she's not pushing 50 like you are. Go tend to your stock portfolio or some yep, shit. Then they got, Meanwhile, in the then next they got over, minus, minus 10 nuts. Silver Shamrock tag that fell off he was on, he was on 15%. Oh, man, if those are anything like the tie tags on Beanie Babies, that mask ain't worth shit anymore. Her amateur tinkering leads to a freaking blue beam blast that hits her in the face and gives us another great kill, because that's what this movie does. Look at her messed up mouth, man. She looks what like the, the chatter or Cenobite. Hell yes, dude. And wait, what the fuck? What the fuck is that bug doing crawling out of her mouth like that. Sick, man. That's almost as gross as the sex scene this kill is in her cot with. Another title card informs us that it's finally Halloween Eve, and Dan calls up Teddy, who's working on the weekend, because she can't seem to find any human parts in her autopsy sample of the hospital assassin. Just plastic and metal. Dan and Ellie head to the Silver Shamrock factory to find more clues about her father's death, and while they're there, they run into Buddy Kupfer and his clan, who are there for a special tour of the factory, since he's the best-selling Silver Shamrock salesperson in the country. The tour will be led by Connell Cochran himself, the movie's big bad, played by a friggin' Oscar-nominated actor, Dan O'Hurlihy. I swear I've seen him before. Yeah, he really is. He's one of the best parts of this movie, honestly. Cochran allows Dan and Ellie to join the tour I swear for plot I've seen him purposes, before. Not so like everyone life, gets to peek behind the curtain like, of a company movie. that somehow turns a profit with only three fucking masks in their stock. Shit, we had more pin variants than that when we launched our merchandise at deadmeatstore.com. And no, I will not apologize for that shameless plug because this is America. Buddy Jr. even gets a yeah, shitty little pumpkin wrap 
wrapped around relaxed. his head from Cochran himself. Tee hee, what fun! Cochran gets real cagey though when he talks about the quote unquote final processing of the masks, which is apparently all done behind this very discreet door in the factory. The best thing about this little mystery is this hilarious line delivery from Betty Kupfer. What final <laughs> process? Don't ask me. On their way out from the factory, Ellie sees her dad's car in a garage, but she's stopped from looking further into it by more of Cochran's goo. They head back to their motel room where Dan knocks back another drink before running over to the office so he can try to call the police. The phone line doesn't work and when he gets back to his room, Ellie is missing and standing outside is a quintet of thugs just waiting for his drunk ass. He it's climbs out the back window home, of his man. motel room and makes a run for it, harkening back to Harry Grimbridge's nah. night flight that kicked Andrew this whole Tate movie off. Not for he the makes his way back nigga. to the Silver Shamrock factory and breaks inside, but after oh, a short oh, investigation, oh, the only like thing he finds is a nice old lady knitting in a rocking chair. When he tries to ask her where Ellie is, her frickin' head falls off. Oh shit, Dan, you shook her way too hard. Inside her neck is a bunch of gears and worry bits that leave Dan so astounded he doesn't hear Dick Warlock coming up behind him, who promptly throws him into another room. Damn, Much bigger, nigga, like 72 throwing your ass like that, fight, Dan gets the upper hand and winds up punching straight through the goon's abdomen, which causes him to puke out a real nasty looking yellow phlegm and expose that he's got a bunch of wires inside his belly. So yeah, these thugs have been androids, but I'll still include them on the count since I set that precedent with Ash and Bishop in the Alien franchise. However, mm -hmm. before you say anything, I'm not including the decapitated old lady because she looks more like a Hall of Presidents animatronic than a convincing synthetic, okay? Also, it just doesn't matter. These videos are for jokes! Dan is cornered by more androids and Cochran himself, who says that the old lady Dan just decapitated was built in 1785. Damn! Cochran hand waves all the android science away by saying the inner mechanics were easy and that the outer appearance wasn't much different than making Halloween masks. A title card tells us that it's finally Halloween and on this very holy morning, Dan is marched into Cochran's bad guy headquarters where that stolen Stonehenge rock is being used for all his bad guy magic and or science. Hey, uh, how'd y'all steal that Stonehenge rock and get it to a factory in California? We had a time getting it here. You wouldn't believe how we did it. Uh, no. No, I would not. That's why I'm asking. Uh, oh, Put that shit on a it. cargo helicopter like GTA. It? Okay, cool. Yep, Stonehenge is the thing powering the evil buttons on the back of Cochran's masks, like the one that killed Marge Gutman, whose body is still in their factory for some reason. Cochran wants to show Dan a live demonstration, though, so his henchmen march the very naive Kupfer family into a dreary test room without any windows under the guise of getting their feedback on a new Silver Shamrock ad campaign. With some beep boops and a knob twirl, we see the world most obnoxious commercial again. And that includes head-on, applied directly to forehead. It instructs its viewers to put on their silver shamrock masks and watch the TV closely as a pumpkin gives us some Pokemon seizures. Little Buddy's mask button starts glowing, and in short order, we get to see what Cochran's got planned for the rest of the country that night. Apparently, it's to kill kids by turning their heads into mush. Holy shit, Halloween 3 just killed a fucking kid, dude! And in the what? most disgusting way, too, because there are all sorts of bugs coming out of that kid's skull. And a snake? A giant fucking snake? Whoa, dude, get the fuck out of here. Buddy's that parents are killed like as trigger, well bro. after Betty faints and Buddy Sr. is bit by his son's head rattler. He collapses to the ground on the monitors and we watch as their bodies are overcome by the various critters that their dead son just gave trigger. birth to from his brain. It's a totally bizarre and unforgettable scene and it's part of why I fucking love this movie. Yeah, bro. Just don't question why Cochran wants I'll to turn kids into bugs and kill their parents get this shit out the way. It's a shitty plan that doesn't make sense, but fuck it. Later that day, the commercial plays for the bazillionth time in this movie as kids rush to the stores so they can all wear the same three fucking masks as everyone else. How are you about to get excited about looking the exact same as a third of all the other kids in the country? Although, I guess they can add their own personal flair to each costume, as we see in this coast-to-coast -coast montage, as director Tommy Lee Wallace's voice reminds them all of what's to come. Don't forget to wear your masks. Be in front of your TV sets for the horathon. And remember the big giveaway at 9. Wait a minute, what time zone is that commercial gonna air in? Because if it's 9 o'clock Eastern, then those California kids will probably hear about the deaths before it gets to them three hours later. But if it's 9 o'clock Western, then you know those East Coast kitties will be passed the fuck out by then. How does your shitty plan work, Cochran? Back in Teddy's office, she's still looking through the android's ashes and trying to get you know a hold of Dan on the phone when got the thug sneaks in and steals a power drill so he can separate, wrap this subplot uh, up real quick. Dead, he does so by coming dogs. up behind Teddy and knocking her to the floor then taking the power drill to her head. But unfortunately, he's done off screen in the only scene that this movie ever shows restraint. Oh, what, Season of the Witch? You're cool showing a kid's head 
head turn to mush, but you won't get down and dirty with a driller killer? It's now 7.30. Again, what time zone? And Cochran ties up Dan in a chair so we can deliver a bad guy monologue that where's kind of Dan's explains bitch? why he's doing like, this. It's because people nowadays don't respect the classic traditions Dan of needs Halloween, to find his or bitch. as he correctly pronounces it, the fuck all out of this shit. Get Good your job, bitch. Cochran. Apparently, it's time to reclaim the holiday because, like, the planets are aligned or some shit? Whatever. He puts a mask on Dan's head and tells him Happy Halloween as the original Halloween movie starts playing on the TV. But Dan is one of those people who thinks the OG film is overrated and boring, so he kicks out the television, cuts through his restraints, then tosses his mask in an amazing throw to cover the camera in the room. He escapes through an air vent like he's the new James Bond with none of the training but twice the alcoholism. And he eventually finds his way to Ellie's uh, room to remind the audience that she was once a character in this movie. They escape down the hallway and into the giant warehouse operating room where they're able to sneak by Cochran and his crew disguised as a sentient rack of Halloween masks. Man, this is some Scooby-Doo shit. Dan discovers that the boxes all around them are full of those kill buttons, so in a fun, if highly unlikely sequence, he manages to sneak his way over to a control panel without any of the dozens of henchmen seeing him, and boot up the commercial to start playing on all the TVs in the room. Then he takes a box of the silver shamrock buttons and tosses them from the rafters down into the control room below. It's at this point that I'm kicking myself for making that androids count on the list rule earlier, because the commercial triggers all these buttons to go off and kill Cochran's henchmen with a bunch of electric beams that blast them to death, but don't result in bugs yeah, or anything, but it's just dumb. the equally disgusting yellow phlegm spit up. Luckily, a couple of overhead shots make things easier for me, and I was able to count 16 bodies around the warehouse. This I'm pretty confident kind of in that fucking number. Stupid. As for Cochran himself, he simply looks up at Dan and Ellie in the rafters and applauds them with a golf clap. As the Stonehenge rock gets pissed, and a giant blue circle apparates out of all the monitors in the control room. Together, the two beacons of energy, or whatever the fuck, send a couple of kill beams into Cochran that turns him into a paper man and then makes him disappear. What the fuck, man? Dan and Ellie run away from the Silver Shamrock factory as it turns into a spitting image of hell on earth. On their way to stop Cochran's plan from Yo, that through, shit Dan like realizes that Ellie hasn't spoken PNDs, a goddamn bro. word since he rescued her. And it turns out that's because she's a fembot looking to kill him with a deadly face grab. Quick, Dan, play Divinals. I can't say for certain this means that the real Ellie Grimbridge was killed, so I'm not gonna put her on the list. But I will go ahead and put the Elliebot 5000 on the list after Dan crashes the car and gets the best of her in a fight with a tire iron that he uses to knock her head clean off. Good thing that's over with, and we can add another solid kill to the count. Great work, Season of the Witch. Oh, wait, her disembodied arm is still kicking, or punching, or grabbing, I guess. Whatever. Just end this goddamn fight sequence, please. Thank you. <laughs> No, come on! It's okay, Season of the Witch. Every movie has to end at some point, and your yeah. time is just about up. Dan runs off into the woods and winds up coming the across movie that ass, poor beleaguered bro. gas station attendant from the beginning. He gets on the phone and calls up, what, the president of TV or something? And yells at them to take the commercial off the air or else it'll kill a bunch of kids. It's taken off one network, and as Dan watches, hopefully, a second. But it looks like the commercial is still running on channel number three. As that deadly pumpkin flashes on the screen, Dan pleads for the person on the phone to take the ad off the third network. Network. Turn it off. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's how this movie ends. With the potential of death of like all the kids in the country, or at least in the Western time zone. Who the fuck knows? I don't include potential Western. kills like that on the count, but don't worry, there were still plenty of others on screen. Yo. Let's get to the numbers. No, no, no. No, no. no you gotta turn it yeah, off. No, no, no. Please stop it. Stop it. You don't got your mask stop on, it. bro. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Nah, nigga don't got his mask over. There were 28 confirmed deaths in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and the victims included 5 male Finally! humans, 3 female humans, 19 male I love androids, streaming, and 1 damn, female bro. android, giving us one of those rare 4-piece pie charts. With a runtime of 98 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average every 3.5 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Starker. Lots of cool deaths in here, but I just can't get over Dick Warlock pulling a dude's head off with his bare hands. It's just awesome. Doll Machete for Man, lamest kill will go to Teddy, cause like, come on, movie, show us that drill to the head. And that's it. Halloween 3, Season I, of the I Witch, came out in 1982 and had most of the same crew as Halloween 2, even if it was lacking Michael Myers. He would return six years later in Halloween 4, which I'll cover next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Alexi Pelkinen, Richard Lucero, and Adam Doran. If you didn't know, there's a Dead Meat James subreddit. Lately, it's been a lot more active. Check it out at reddit.com slash r. All right, y'all. All right, y'all. That's it. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get up off of here.